Today we're going to review topic 2.1 on motion. Here's the information from the guide. Don't forget, you've got to become very familiar with what's in your data booklet. Make sure you know what equations are given, what equations are not given, and what letters are being used to represent the different physical quantities. Also, use your guide to know what definitions you're going to be responsible for and to find out what you are responsible for and what you're not responsible for. The topic of motion has a lot of very closely related concepts, and it's very important that you distinguish them clearly. So let's imagine that we've got an object executing some sort of motion. Then we can talk about average or instantaneous values for that motion. And in particular, let's talk about the average velocity for our trip. If we wanted to talk about the average velocity, all we have to do is consider the two endpoints and we could draw a vector called the displacement vector. The IB will use an S for the displacement vector. And you'd take that vector and you'd divide it by the amount of time it took to make that motion. So your average velocity would equal displacement over time. However, if you're talking about the average speed, then we would have to consider the path taken. You'd have to look at that total distance there. Let's say the total distance is d. Divide that by the amount of time that the motion took and you'd get an average speed. And it's important to note here that for average values the magnitude of the velocity does not equal the speed. Now if we consider instantaneous values we're considering a single instant in time. So you might see it written that the instantaneous velocity would be equal to the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta s all over delta t. So you're considering a very small displacement vector about the point in question. And you're making that displacement vector shorter and shorter because you're making the time smaller and smaller. So we get an instantaneous velocity by taking an average value over a very short time interval. And for instantaneous values, the magnitude of the velocity is equal to the instantaneous speed. It's not true for average values, but it is true for instantaneous values. So if at any instant, your velocity is 30 meters per second east. That would imply that your speed is 30 meters per second. Works for instantaneous, doesn't work for average. One of the biggest conceptual problems I see with students is that they don't clearly distinguish between velocity and acceleration. And that can lead to a lot of problems. So let's do that now. First thing, units. The units for velocity are meters per second. Whereas the units for acceleration are meters per second every second. So it's how fast the speed changes per unit time. The second thing is that acceleration is always proportional in size to the net force. So when you think acceleration, think net force, because they're proportional to one another anyways. They're a measure of one another. Whereas for velocity, velocity stays constant if the net force is zero. So we don't even need a net force to have a velocity. And the third important thing is that acceleration is always in the same direction as the net force. Very different for velocity. If you've got a velocity and a net force in the same direction, then of course the object speeds up. If the velocity and the net force are in opposite directions, then they slow down. And if the velocity and the force are in perpendicular directions, then we get a turning motion. So that's three ways that velocity is very, very different from acceleration. The most important things for you to know about motion graphs is how to read or how to interpret a position time or displacement time graph and a VT graph, a velocity time graph. So let's first of all consider the position time graph. If we've got an XT or displacement time graph, then if we want to know whether it's positioned 
to the left or to the right, then we look at whether it's positioned below or above the time axis. So we consider whether it's above or below the t-axis. If we want to consider which way it's moving, is it moving to the left or to the right, then we want to look at whether we've got a positive slope or a negative slope. If we want to consider whether it's slowing down or speeding up, then we want to consider steepness. So if it's doing this, it's slowing because it's getting less steep. But this would also be slowing down because it's getting less steep as well. And then finally, if we want to consider the acceleration, is the acceleration to the left or to the right? Well, first of all, remember that it's always in the same direction as the force. And what we look for on the graph is whether it's going to be a concave up or it's concave down. So we'll get a positive acceleration if it's concave up and a negative acceleration if it's concave down. Now let's look at the VT graph. This time we don't know about the position, but we can tell about the movement. If our V is above the time axis, then it's moving to the right. If it's below the time axis, it's moving to the left. So above or below the time axis tells you whether it's moving left or right. If we want to know whether it's slowing down, or speeding up, then we look at whether it's whether the line is getting closer to or getting farther away from the time axis. The farther away the point is from the time axis, the greater the speed. And then in terms of acceleration, if we want to know if it's a positive or negative acceleration, we consider the slope. So a positive slope would be an acceleration to the right. A negative slope would be an acceleration to the left. And we have a few more important ideas to do with the slopes of graphs. If we've got, say, a position time graph, and let's say it looks something like this, then we can take any two points on that curve and connect them with a line. And we'd call that line a secant. Then the rise of that line is going to be well, delta x. The run here is going to be delta t. So the slope of our secant would equal our average velocity on a position time graph. If we wanted an instantaneous velocity at an instant in time, we'd draw a tangent line. And the slope of the tangent would equal the instantaneous velocity. Now, of course, we could switch this to a VT graph, and then the slope of the secant would be the average acceleration and the slope of the tangent on a VT graph would be the instantaneous acceleration. Something else that you might see is aligned motion graphs. So you've got a graph of position, one of velocity, one, ex one of acceleration, all against time. And they're aligned in time. So let's say our position graph looks like so. Then this would represent the same time for all three graphs. And we can use the idea that the slope of an xt graph is the value on the vt graph. And the slope on a vt graph becomes the value on an at graph. So here we've got a strong positive slope. We'll get a strong positive velocity. Here we have a zero slope, so we'll get zero velocity. Here we have a negative slope, so we'll get a negative velocity. And if that's constant acceleration, we'll get a straight line. And then here we've got a constant negative slope that's going to produce a constant negative value in the acceleration time graph. So we can transform from position time to velocity time to acceleration time using the idea that slope becomes value. One of the main skills you need to have for this particular unit is to be able to use these equations here to solve one-dimensional constant acceleration problems. And typically, the technique you would use is to make a variable list. So we've really got five variables here. We've got the initial velocity, the final velocity, the acceleration, the displacement, and the time.
And remember, these are vector quantities, but it's one-dimensional motion. And so that vector nature is merely represented by plus or minus signs. And it's very important in these problems to keep your signs straight. And typically what happens in the problems is you'll be given three out of the five quantities. Maybe the initial velocity, the acceleration, and the time are given. And maybe you're asked for the velocity and one quantity is not involved. Now each of these four equations has one of those five variables missing. The equation that does not involve displacement is this equation here. So we'd use that equation and solve for the final velocity in the problem. We then extended we then extended the ideas from one-dimensional motion to two-dimensional motion in the case of projectiles. And the first thing to realize about projectiles was the idea of independence of the vertical and horizontal motion. So if we've got some object and we just drop it, and at exactly the same time we release another object horizontally, then after the same amount of time they will have fallen the same distance. And they will in fact hit the ground at the same time. So we get the same time of fall, whether we release it horizontally or just let it drop straight down. And if we take a general projectile, and here's its parabolic path if there's no air resistance, then we can pick out some instant in time, and we could talk about its horizontal position x and its vertical position y. We could talk about its velocity, which would be tangential to the path. And we could talk about the horizontal and vertical components of that velocity. So we could talk about a vx and a vy. We could also talk about the acceleration of the particle, which of course would be straight down at negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, horizontally, there aren't any forces. So the horizontal motion, that Vx, doesn't change. I can pick any time here and I'd still get the same Vx. Of course my Vy is going to change due to the acceleration of gravity. So using this idea of independence of horizontal and vertical motion, I can write equations for the motion in the x-direction and in the y direction. In the x direction, well, ax, there are no horizontal forces, so there's no horizontal acceleration. vx is just going to be a constant value because there's no horizontal forces again. And it will equal whatever the initial x component of velocity was. If we know what this angle is, and we know what the initial velocity was, then of course vx naught will equal v naught cos theta. And by naught will equal v naught sine theta. For the horizontal position, assuming it starts at position zero, it's going to go a distance equal to that constant speed times the amount of time it's in the air. So really all we're doing in the x direction is using our constant speed equation. Speed equals distance over time. In the y direction, we have constant acceleration, so we're going to use our constant acceleration equations. The acceleration in the y direction is equal to negative g. The velocity in the y direction would be equal to whatever initial vertical velocity it had, but then it's going to lose g 9.8 meters per second of speed every second. And its vertical position will be given by, well, if it had any initial vertical height, we'd want to include that. Plus, this is how high it would get if there were no gravity, just the vertical speed times time. Then we've got to subtract off a half gt squared. So if there were no gravity, the object 
would have gone in a straight line path. Gravity brings it down by one half gt squared and thus it executes this parabolic path. The two most common things that you're asked for in a projectile problem are the maximum height and the range. If you're asked for a maximum height, then the maximum height occurs when the vertical velocity is zero. So your first step is to set vy equal to zero. Once you've done that, you can solve for the time at which maximum height occurs. Once you got the t value, then you can plug that t value and solve for the maximum height. If you're asked for a range, then typically you set y equal to zero, and once again you solve for t, the time at which it hits the ground. Once you've got the time, then you can solve for how far across it landed. Now there are a few tricks to that. If you already know the maximum height and you have a symmetrical situation where it leaves at the same height as it lands, then you can say that if the time to reach maximum height is t, then the time to hit the ground will just be 2t. And be a little careful if you have a cliff situation. In that case, you might set y to be 0 on the top of the cliff and y to be equal to some negative value at the bottom of the cliff. And in this case you'd want to set y in this statement to minus 50. And finally let's see how fluid resistance would affect the motion of a vertical projectile. And I'm going to use an R here to represent the force of fluid resistance. And we're just going to consider the case of an object that's thrown straight up and comes straight down. So let's consider on the way up. So here's our object. It's going to have two forces on it. It's going to have the weight mg down and the air resistance is also going to act down. So both forces are acting in the same direction. And that's going to lead to an acceleration that is bigger in magnitude than 9.8 meters per second squared. In other words, on the way up the object's going to lose more than 9.8 meters per second of speed every second. On the way down, it's a little bit different. Naturally, the weight doesn't change. But what's important to realize is that air resistance, of course, increases with speed. So the air resistance near the top isn't going to be as big as later on. And eventually, the air resistance is going to grow big enough that it will be equal in size to the weight. And that means there will be no net force. And of course, when there's no net force, there's no acceleration, and the object reaches a constant speed. We call that constant speed the terminal velocity, or terminal speed. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.